Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel McCarthy. I am the Intercollegiate Studies Institute's Vice President for the Collegiate Network. And what that means is that I act as the connection between ISI as a whole, the organization that was founded in 1953 to educate for liberty, and the Collegiate Network, which is one of its key programs and branches. We are thrilled by the work that all of you are doing on your campuses. You are the best of the best, the creme de la creme, the true elite of conservatives, of independents, of thinkers, of student activists and journalists on your campuses all across the country. Uh, thanks to you, stories have been broken that otherwise would have been buried by a complacent uh, media environment, an academic environment. Thanks to you, a number of perspectives that need to be heard on our country, campuses and in our country have been given a voice. And so we are thrilled to be hosting you for this uh, weekend, and uh, we have an enormously rewarding program lined up for tonight and tomorrow. I want to begin tonight's program by welcoming Molly Hemingway. Molly is a senior editor at The Federalist and a senior journalism fellow at Hillsdale College. She's also a Fox News contributor and the author of Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Court. And she's also the author of the best book on the 2020 election, Rigged, How the Media, Big Tech, and the Democrats Seized Our Elections. Please join me in welcoming Molly Hemingway. It's great to be here with you. I am um, no pressure to any of you, but I'm excited to speak to you because the world needs you, the country needs you, and I'm counting on you guys to save the country eventually. We'll give you a few years, but just keep that in mind that that's happening. So I was not a student journalist in college, but my husband was. You all look incredibly respectable and put together. Um, his student paper did ne never seemed that way. The Oregon commentator, where he, uh, where he did student journalism, they were the type of people who needed to be told to put pants on, or um, not to drink and edit at the same time. But you guys seem very, like you seem you seem put together. Um, I want to just tell a few stories of doing journalism, which for me began after college, um, and then we will open it up to questions and you can think about what you want to ask now. Um, so I got into journalism in part because I had all these friends who were doing it and they seemed like they really enjoyed it. Like it was really fun. They did not seem to be paid very well, but they were really having a good time. And so I went into it as a second career, really enjoyed it, but was doing a lot of just, you know, I was working for a Gannett publication for a very long time, a big media company, just covering the federal government, but I had all these interests in other things. And one of those things I was doing, I was um, on the side working for a media criticism place where we would analyze how well the media was covering different things. And this began my complete disillusionment with our corporate press. But there was this story out of Philadelphia, and it was about this guy named Kermit Gosnell. A little bit, little bit not great to talk about at dinner, but. Kermit Gosnell was this serial killer who had run an abortion clinic for a long time, and he had gotten charged in the murders of a few of his victims. So uh, one woman, I think, and several of the children that he had killed, he ends up being charged with this. And the day that the story broke, it was actually huge national news. Um, a, a grand jury had indicted him, and it went, it went on to like all the major media that night. And it was just interesting because it was such an important story. This guy had run a clinic in a very bad way. He, um, he had given better treatment to people who had more money. He had uh, abused like immigrants and minority patients. It was, it was a filthy clinic. You know, he had animals in there. He kept trophies of his victims like he would keep their feet and he'd keep them in the refrigerator next to where like the staff had their meals. Sorry, this is very, I'm really sorry. I hope you all were done with your <laughs> dessert. Um, so really interesting details. And usually in this country, when you have a serial killer, it's like a huge media story. People cover it and they just won't stop covering it. In this case, it was a one day story and then it just went away. And I had been frustrated with people for that for a while. 
And they said, well, once it actually goes to trial, like he's been charged, but once it goes to trial, we'll cover it more. Well, it went to trial, no coverage, no coverage whatsoever. Uh, there was like one local reporter who took a picture of the press section that had been reserved for the trial and it was just empty of people. So I decided to ask some people about this. So prior to this story, there had been a series of stories that had kind of been bad for pro-lifers. Uh, there was a guy who ran for Senate in Missouri named Todd Aiken who said something a little imprecise about abortion, and he had lost his Senate race over it. And every single pro-life candidate in the country had been asked by members of the media what they thought about what this guy said. It had been a massive story. Um, the Susan G. Komen Foundation, which was to help women with breast cancer, had decided to stop funding Planned Parenthood. And the media covered that, and they tried to force the Susan G. Komen Foundation to fund Planned Parenthood. And there was another story that they just, you know, they, they, they did so many. So what I would do is I would take a reporter and I would calculate how many stories they had written on these three previous stories. Oh, I think maybe it was a Wendy Davis story, anyway. Um, and then I would ask them why they hadn't covered the Gosnell story. And this was back in the day and age when you could ask people questions on Twitter and they would respond. It's kind of exciting. I'd say, um, so-and-so, you wrote 87 total stories on these three, yet you haven't covered the Gosnell trial. Why not? And I would get them to respond and essentially got, the, got them shamed into finally covering this trial of a serial killer. My favorite response I got, by the way, was for um, a woman at the Washington Post who said uh, to my inquiry, she said, Thanks, Molly. I'm a health policy reporter. I don't cover local crime. And it was such a bad response that even all of her liberal allies at the Washington Post was, were like, ooh, not a good answer. Of course, people cover local crime all the time, right? Like, local crime can become a really interesting story for any number of reasons. I mean, sadly, you have a school shooting. That's a local crime, but that does not keep people from covering it at the national level. You have a police uh, policeman killing a black man. That, that's a local crime issue, but it also becomes a national story. So it was absurd to say that you couldn't cover it. Anyway, they ended up covering it a little and then went back to their ways, as you can see in how our corporate media have been covering abortion issues all year long. Okay, second story is related to the nomination of Justice Kavanaugh. So I ended up co-writing a book on this, on this with uh, Carrie Severino, who is a wonderful constitutional lawyer. She clerked at the Supreme Court. And we, uh, yeah, we wrote a book on it. And the reason why we wrote a book on it was that corporate media had run this entire operation to take him out. So. George, or, uh, Donald Trump gets elected on the promise that he will appoint constitutional justices. It's a huge issue. One in four people who vote for him say that the Supreme Court was in their mind as, as uh, the reason why they would do it. And so he nominates Gorsuch, he's confirmed, then he nominates Kavanaugh. When Gorsuch was confirmed, he was replacing Scalia. It's kind of like a one-for-one one type thing. When Kavanaugh was nominated, and Kavanaugh is an extremely moderate justice, most conservatives would have liked someone far more conservative than, than he is. But he was replacing Anthony Kennedy, who the left really felt was one of their own. And people were worried that if you appointed constitutional justices, that Roe v. Wade might be overturned because Roe v. Wade is not a very good, was not a very good decision. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg admitted that Roe v. Wade was a horribly decided opinion. And so it was, it was worrisome to people who love what Roe v. Wade resulted in that that might happen. So Kavanaugh is nominated and it's a very difficult operation to take him down because in addition to being really moderate, He's also really boring. And so there was just kind of nothing there. He was known as a really nice guy. He'd been a federal judge for 12 years.
been happily married for ever. He had, you know, happy family. And there was this initial effort where the Washington Post tried to drum up some drama. Like he is a big sports fan, and so he had gone in with a group of people to buy season tickets to the Nationals, and he had bought the tickets and then had people, you might, I'm glad you're sitting down, he had people repay him. I know, I know, it's amazing that this guy could be put on our highest court when he was a season ticket holder to a baseball team. So they were trying to make all these things out of it, and it kind of didn't work. But there was extreme opposition before anything happened, before any allegations were put forth. People were protesting, were trying to prevent him from meeting with senators who would need to vote on it. And he gets through the whole process, even though it's crazy, there are all these fights. And as soon as he's about to be cleared out of committee, these allegations drop that he had sexually assaulted someone when he was a teenager. These allegations were very murky. It was really unclear what was being said. They were dripped out slowly by the Washington Post. There was this big, big story, very carefully written to make it seem really bad. And what was interesting is it was an almost exact replay of what had been done to Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas had gone through brutal confirmation hearings. Uh, people were very upset with him for being uh, not just conservative, but a conservative black man, which was very hard for the left to, to accept and is to this day. And after he's about to get through, a friendly reporter to the left leaks an allegation that he had sexually harassed someone. Hearings are reopened. Uh, it, it's televised. It grips everybody's attention. And that was exactly what happened here. Well, when that had happened, after Clarence Thomas went through all of this ordeal, even the New York Times polling showed that Americans, by like a two to one margin, believed him over his accuser. But that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that, that he'd gone through this and that people believed him. The left basically decided that they would work to marginalize him until he died. And so they did articles, books, documentaries, movies, all designed to make people sort of question what they knew about that situation. Carrie and I knew that was gonna happen, and we knew that this Washington Post reporter who had run the anti-Kavanaugh operation was gonna write a book about it. So we decided we would write a book about it. And we interviewed more than 100 people to get the, the real story of how this confirmation had gone through. And it was one of these upsides of having our corporate press be so evil and awful, which is nobody wanted to talk to the bad reporters that had tried to sabotage the nomination, but they were willing to talk to us. So we got you know, Supreme Court justices and all the senators and president and vice president, all the key players, and we wrote just the definitive history of what had happened. And we found out so many interesting things about the operation to take him out. Um, we found out that uh, you know, we, we got like to do deep dives on different people who are involved in the story. One of the tacks taken by the left was to just delay that confirmation as long as possible. And they said that they needed the FBI to reopen an investigation. And at the end of the day, he could have been confirmed, but Jeff Flake gets berated, Senator Jeff Flake from Arizona gets berated in an elevator by two paid activists and he kind of crumbles and he works to extend the FBI investigation for a week. And at the end of that, all of these senators got to go into a skiff, like a, a secure area, and read what the FBI had found. And when they came out, it was really interesting because nobody was talking about delaying anymore. Clearly what they had read in the skiff was not favorable to the cause of delay. And what we were able to figure out and report was that one of the four supposedly corroborating witnesses for the woman who made the accusation, she said there were four people at the party where this thing happened uh, with, with Brett Kavanaugh, was the woman's really good friend, Leland Kaiser. And Leland Kaiser 
when the story first came out, she felt really bad because she couldn't remember anything bad happening at this party. And she really felt like if something bad had happened, she would have known. And as she starts thinking more and more, you know, and this is uh, four years ago, about this time, she realizes that she doesn't believe her friend. She had said something about how she had no recollection, and all these people started bullying her and trying to get her to change her story. So when the FBI does this extended investigation, what they realize is nothing new. There's no new information, except that there was witness tampering against Kavanaugh. So we, you know, we got to do this thing where we were interviewing, you know, more than 100 people, getting really good, really good, interesting stories, and we published that book. We were the first book on the Kavanaugh confirmation, heavily, he heavily reported, incredible detail, incredible corroboration. It was a really good bestseller, and it remains one of my favorite things I've ever gotten to do in my reporting career. The final thing I just wanted to mention was another thing that I'm very proud of, which is resisting what was called the Russia collusion hoax. So in 2016, most members of the media told everybody there was no way that Donald Trump could ever be president. And they were obviously quite wrong. Uh, rather than reflect on their failures and their failure of imagination and failure to understand the people that they should cover, they decided to embrace this crazy conspiracy theory. It wasn't that they were wrong so much as that Donald Trump was a secret spy who had colluded with Russia to steal the 2016 election. They thought that explained it more than that they were liberal hacks who just didn't understand the country. And so they, they poured themselves into this absurd conspiracy theory. They did story after story, day after day, week after week, and it was everybody. I mean, CNN put out stories, New York Times, Washington Post. All of these people would end up winning awards for pushing a delusional and false conspiracy theory that the 2016 election had been stolen because Donald Trump was a secret Russian spy. And it was one of the most difficult things to push back against because everybody in this town believed this and was pushing it. And I had the, I had the benefit of having some really good information on the front end. Well, first of all, I had the benefit of actually knowing people who had voted for Donald Trump, which made me different than most reporters. So I had the inkling that maybe this story wasn't quite right. And then I also had some good information. It was an information operation from what is called the intelligence community, which I figured out pretty quickly. But as I pushed back on this, long before I and my publication were completely vindicated in pushing back on this, we got a tremendous amount of pressure from people who said that we were wrong. Included in that was that I had a US senator actually have a, um, like an intervention with me where he had me into his office to tell me that he knew more than I did and that it was going to go very poorly for me and that he was you know, basically telling me that the Russia collusion story was real. It was difficult for me to fight against that and it was scary because resisting, being skeptical of even absurd stories holds a lot of risk. You, if you're right and nobody else is right, they don't like that. And it was one of the more difficult reporting things in my life. At the end of the day, of course, um, after many tens of millions of dollars spent and many investigations, it turned out, and I think I might be as surprised as anyone, given who he is, that they were unable to find like any justification for the Russia collusion hoax. There was nobody who had conspired with Russia to steal the 2016 election, not even like an average American, certainly not anyone in the Trump campaign. And it was a complete journalistic failure what they had done. They've never admitted that they're wrong. But I just mention it because I think it's important that you understand the courage needed to fight these things. I always like the Pat Buchanan quote that courage is contagious. Courage is contagious. Defiance can lead to a recovery of will. It can be inspiring to see someone who chooses to risk their well-being for a higher good. And we live in a time when people act like stating one's sexual preference is courageous, 
I always like David Azerod's definition, which is, courage is the bold and principled defiance of the lies of our age. We have, and I think most of you are right of center, the conservative establishment, its politicians, its media, they do not lack ideas or people, but too many of them do lack determination and endurance and fearlessness, and people can tell. The conservative movement in DC has too often been engaged in insincere opposition to progressivism's march through institutions, both public and private. It has seemed mostly interested in negotiating the terms of its surrender or managing the decline of the country than preserving the republic. It has stood athwart history impotently suggesting that progressives slow down. Michael Malice has said that conservatism is just progressivism with a speed limit. Institutional conservatism and its alleged leaders have too frequently accepted the propaganda press's treatment of conservatives as second-class citizens. So for conservatism to mean anything now, it has to be about rejecting this rigged system. You can't just say stop. You don't say stop, but then bend the knee in cowardice when the mob comes. That brings even more harm to our neighbors and does nothing to prevent the destruction of the country. It's not comfortable for some conservatives who value civility and order to think this way, but the fact is that many Americans feel alienated from and no longer feel at home in our own country. The moral climate has been degraded as the left has taken over every single one of the powerful institutions in the country and is actively pushing people to lead a life of godlessness, barrenness, selfishness, gluttony, and addiction to outrage and dopamine. So all of a sudden, the conservative project is not so much a conservative one as a counter-revolutionary one. And anyone who dares to take on the broken and corrupt politics of our media complex is teed up for destruction. Lesser men will cower in the face of risk and the cost of standing up to the system becomes steeper and steeper. You will not be locked up for saying the truth yet, but you will be demonized and stigmatized, deplatformed, you might lose your job. And the end result is that America's ability to get the course correction it desperately needs gets delayed. At some point, if more people don't stand up and fight hard, the nation is going to die. Having said that, we must inoculate ourselves against excessive, if fashionable, pessimism. The truth may not prevail, but until then, there's a heartwarming amount of defiance left in this country. And we should also guard against mindless hopefulness. Hope is a virtue, but it can be a bit of a vice if it's an unwarranted faith that everything will work out in this world or for this country. It's not enough that someone fights. The fight must be smart, and tactical. We're clearly entering an era where dissidents will be required, where dissidents will be required. There's no value in secular martyrdom or being just another victim of the regime. Your fight must be supplemented by prudence and strategy. Be bold and defiant, but know where to aim your fire. Okay, I'm done. I'm done with that, but I just hope, again, you got a few years in college to keep working on honing these skills and then you have to save, save the country, as I mentioned. So I would uh, love to take any questions and uh, keep the conversation going. Or I can just keep talking at you, but I think questions are better. I think maybe there's a microphone here. I can't really see. I have a uh, studio microphone okay. here, so please do come and line up. I guess I go first. <clears throat> Hello, my name is uh, Vincent Corey. I am uh, from St. Louis University. It's my college. And my question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the 1960 presidential election, if you know what that is about? Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. I didn't tell the story of another reporting thing I'd done recently. Um, which is writing this book on the 2020 election, which I did because 
I enjoy pain or something like that. Um, I was very frustrated in the 2020 election in the aftermath, it seemed like there were these dueling conspiracy theories. Um, one, dueling, one of the conspiracy theories was obviously like Venezuela took over voting machines to deliver the outcome. And then you would have other people say that this election was totally fine and there, was, that there were no problems. So I wanted to report and find out what had happened. And you know, there's a truth that if questioning election results were a crime, the entire Democrat Party and the entire media complex would be in prison right now. The last time Democrats fully accepted a presidential election that they lost was at best 1988 with George W. Bush. And you know, we see all the ways that that has happened, most notably in 2016 with this elaborate conspiracy theory. But what I thought was so insane about making any questions about the 2020 election a crime is that our country, of course, has had a ton of elections that are problematic. Uh, most notably, for presidential history, most recently, I would say, for presidential history, the 1960 election, where a suspiciously high number of vote totals in Chicago and the entire state of Texas, where Lyndon B. Johnson had a history of rigging elections, determined the outcome uh, in Kennedy's favor. And so it's not like absurd to be worried about it. That final vote, I think, came down to like 180,000 votes was how close that election was. The 2020 election came down to 43,000 votes across three states. It was very narrowly decided. So I don't know if you have a specific question about 1960. Um, there were, um, so, it for some context, JFK against Richard Nixon, when those two happened, they had a lot of people from the uh, Republican Party, which included Everett Dirksen, if you know who he is, uh, came out and said that the 1960 election had a lot of stuff going on in it that was believed to be fraudulent in, like you said, Chicago and in Texas. Um, a lot of it is in, in part from favor systems, which I think Venezuela also did as well. Um, there was a later on another report in the 1980s which said that there was a few things that were, a um, few vote ballots that weren't necessarily true, but it didn't convey the change in the election. However, um, there were some people who came out that said that there was a huge favor system, in particular in Chicago. I just, that's what I've yeah, heard. Well, I mean, our history in our country of having election problems is focused in cities and it goes back to the founding of the country. So it's not even, you know, it's not even that 1960 in Chicago was particularly unique. It's a little bit less of an issue now in Chicago because it's such a one party state. It's a huge issue in Madison and Milwaukee and Detroit and Philadelphia. Anywhere where people can control state outcomes by focusing on manipulation of a local, like a heavily populated dense population. Um, or city area, that's where you start to see corruption, and you still do. When I was reporting on the book, I noticed that everybody who had grown up in Philly or Detroit were much more aware of the shenanigans that can be done than people who grew up in like Nebraska where it was unthinkable. But anyway. Thank you and God Thank bless. You. Thanks. Hey, uh, my name's Braden. I go to the University of Georgia. Um, so my question was, you mentioned using, you know, as you've said, we're the next generation, but using temperance and prudence um, when handling issues, whether it's just media malpractice, whether it's actual just in politics. Um, I'm sure a lot of us here have very liberal classes, and we can testify that sometimes it's very difficult to be prudent and <laughs> temperate when very absurd and not true things are being said. So what advice would you give on showing prudence, on showing temperance, and not letting those kind of passions build up to where you just want to say, no, you're just wrong and leave it there. <laughs> so I think about this all the time on television, which is a very cool medium, they say, meaning if you show any excitement, it really comes off really hot. So you kind of have to pick what is the thing that you're going to show some excitement over so that you don't just seem like a ranting person on every issue. This is very difficult for me because even though I might present as someone who's fairly calm, I am not. I'm all the time thinking like, I cannot believe how crazy that thing you just said was, or you're so wrong, you're so stupid. And I don't say it, um, I just kind of try to reserve my fire for of one particular thing. And I think that lesson still applies. If you are going off on everything, like at many schools, and I went to the University of Colorado, 
at my school, I could have been opposed to legitimately like 85% of what I was being taught. Um, but I would try to pick the moment so that I would have more of a persuasive um, power. And so I just think like practicing it is also great. Like if you can, you don't want to so suppress your passion that you just become controlled by a system that is very corrupt. So you want to practice a little bit of pushback, but just like thinking about that as a little bit of pushback. If there's a way you can ask questions, if there's a way you can um, just offer a different viewpoint and see how well it goes with your class to make sure, or your teacher, whoever you're trying to influence. But just mostly just good to be thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, one thing that I think about a lot is I have a decent number of friends who are like liberal, progressive, and, and they're very intelligent in general life things, very smart, like very good people. And then I, I mentioned something, we talk about something, and then they live in this fantasy world. It's like totally false ideas, like a complete like conspiracy echo chamber. But my great fear is, is like I'm like a decently intelligent person, or I'm like decently good, but if they can fall into the cave, like what if I do too? Like what are steps we can take to make sure that we ourselves don't end up trapped in the echo chamber? So it's a really great and good question. I would say if you are a right of center person, the risk of this is so much smaller. Like all you have to do is like see a single movie or turn on the radio, <laughs> turn on the TV, and you are exposed to things that are diametrically opposed to what you believe. It just exists out there. You read any major media. So you're just at lower risk. But having said that, I do worry about this, particularly with tech platforms where you're just getting people to just burrow into their own information. And for your sake, no matter what you want to do, I pray that a lot of you do go into journalism. It's a wonderful career, and it's so important that we fight back against all of this propaganda in the, in the press. But whether it's journalism or something else, you will be extremely well served if you intentionally go out of your way to learn how other people think about things and make it, you know, you, you do have to be intentional. It's very easy to have your priors confirmed, to just listen to people who you already agree with. And I, I every day, try to make sure I'm reading the other arguments. I find it actually journalistically helpful because nothing makes me as angry as reading something wrong. And then I know what I want to write because I want to punch back against what's wrong. Um, but I also use like I subscribe to different newspapers or different news sources or I use aggregation tools. I go to Real Clear Politics, which has viewpoints from the left, the right, and just all over the place so that I just make sure I'm exposed. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Liam Siegler. I go to Gordon College. I'm a, is your last I'm a, name Ziegler? Siegler. Oh, okay. Yeah. My maiden name is Ziegler. So oh, really? really <laughs> so. uh, kind of German, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, very simple question. You gave us an injunction um, to save America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I am very curious as to what you mean by that on this side of heaven. How do, how do we save America? Just... You know, one of these things I think about, I mentioned I didn't do journalism in college, but I did start fairly soon after, um, you know, brief time in a different career. And it seemed like there was this period of time where people felt like a little bit of resistance would be all that was needed to have things improve. And I feel like the moment that we're in right now requires really bold action. We are completely off the rails. Um, we have civil unrest and lack of a shared understanding of what it means to be American, what those values are of American values, what self -govern what self-governance is, how it operates. And so I mostly just want you all to understand that because previous generations have not done enough, unfortunately, it's kind of going to be incumbent upon a lot of younger people to study, prepare, and do whatever it is that they can to truly understand what time it is right now, how the time is um, dangerous, 
how things could fall apart. What is that Ronald Reagan, who I actually experienced because I'm that old, said <laughs> that you know freedom is just a generation away from failure. It can go very quickly. We are in a very bad place. I mean, you, you read some progressive author, or you read people who are critiquing progressivism 100 years ago, and they really thought that the march to progressivism and like building up this administrative state in our government would destroy the country. And there are arguments that we are at this moment where we're possibly testing out that proposition. So sorry for not being more specific. It's a million different things you can do. Live your life well, build a family, raise kids well, do your job well, love your neighbors, um, do your work well, know what it means, know how unique this American project is and how important it is to get, to get it back. Journalism is a great way to push back against lies and, and um, the propaganda that's out there, but there are other ways too. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't bring my heels to the conference, but <laughs> um, thank you for speaking with us. My name is Alyssa. I'm from Georgetown University, and my question is in regard to your point about how the conservative movement shouldn't become progressivism with a speed limit. How do we incorporate and mobilize the greatest amount of people possible without negotiating our core values? Yeah, well, I actually think this is one of the things that makes me excited about the current moment that we're in. So when I was your age, uh, conservatism had become a really like stagnant thing. It was like this checklist of things you believed. Are you free market? Check. You know, do you believe in a strong national defense? Check. Um, do you believe in traditional values? Check. And it just had become like so calcified and everybody kind of agreed that everyone believed these same things. They might have a focus in one or the other. And I actually think all those things are very important, but they need to be focused on the issues that are affecting people at their current moment. And so I'm actually very excited about what's happening in conservatism now, because you're having these vibrant debates about how to preserve liberty in a big tech situation. You know, we have tech companies that are more powerful than our own government. That's a challenging, like, that's philosophically challenging of our ideas about businesses being something that no government action should regulate or, you know, whatever the check mark approach is. And so you're having people have, have really uh, interesting ideas there. Or, you know, you look at what's happening abroad and what it means to have a strong national defense. Does that mean building democracies everywhere and doing interventionist war, or every time a bad action takes place, putting all of American resources to bear there? Or does it mean thinking about what your national interest is and focusing on preserving American security and how that might mean that not every battle that's out there is your battle? And so these debates are exciting, but they also can be very popular. Thinking of new, fresh ideas for how to take on some of these problems that are facing our country or the world is, is a way to expand and get a lot of people behind it. And so on the right, you've had this growth in the political movement and, and the kind of growth that you want to have. Like It's a much more, um, like after the last six years, the Republican Party, frankly, but the conservative movement in particular, is much more working class, much more multiracial, much more uh, geographically diverse. These are all important things for the political battles that need to be waged. You do not need to compromise values, in my view, at all. I'm still very much someone who cares about market economics and a strong national defense and, and values. Like, even on the values issue, it's something so much more popular. At The Federalist, we do polling, and there, there's this weird thing. When I was your age, pop culture presented people on the right as being kind of stodgy and telling you what to think and telling you what to do. Well, now, the right is the place that is saying you can think and express yourself and associate with who you want to. And it's a very different political posture, but much more, um, there's, a, there's an advantage to it. There's also the issue of just being normal now places you on the right. So if you don't believe in some of the like radicalism uh, regarding like teaching racism in school, teaching kids like that they're a victim or an oppressor based on their race or whatever, that's a very popular position. It's a very normal thing to oppose racism. 
and it's now also like only in happening in one political movement. So I think it all works together nicely. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. So my name is Thomas Stevenson. I'm at BYU, and uh, me and Luke, he's right, he's right here. We, <clears throat> we run the Cougar Chronicle. Were you guys the people who did that amazing thing? Yeah, with the BYU Duke story. And that relates to my, quest, my okay. question, actually, because that made a huge impact in the political landscape, and that's a big, a big reason why we're here now. But my question relates to how to generate that kind of, obviously, it's not going to be a hit story like that every single time, but generating stuff that makes real impact not just with the conservative groups. On I mean, campus honestly, I feel like you should be lecturing all of us on this. I <laughs> loved that story. I yeah. couldn't believe how great. I get chills just thinking about it. So you had all the right things. Like you had the courage to actually do journalism. Nobody else did journalism. They just jumped to conclusions. You did really good research and investigation. You had an instinct. Like, by the way, the instinct is something that you probably shouldn't get credit for because <laughs> It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. It was like, wait, does it sound normal to think that at our school where something like this has never happened or has not happened at, you know, in any way that would make sense to us, that in a room full of people with cameras going and audio going, that someone would yell a racist insult at a player. And I do appreciate that BYU fans are crazy about volleyball. I really do mean that, that I appreciate that. And I even like that um, Studio C, mm -hmm. Scott, Scott, Scott Sterling is my favorite. I love him. My, my daughter plays volleyball, and she got hit in the head. And I was like, we are going to watch a video about this. Yeah. Um, so we watched Scott Sterling. Yeah. So I get that you guys are all crazy, and you're rabid fans, and all that kind of stuff. But it was just kind of common sense to say, this doesn't actually happen. Like, You'll believe it if it did happen, but you kind of need it to be shown. This is what I feel like about the Kavanaugh story. Certainly willing to believe anything that someone puts forth, but they better after the Clarence Thomas situation, after everything else, they really better convince me. So uh, you did a great job, and I love that it was like defending truth at your school, and this will serve you well in more stories about your school. Like you just did it naturally, I assume. I don't even know. Yeah, but we, one thing about it is we, what was it? Yes, yeah. I guess the bigger, the bigger point is how do we produce, not necessarily that story, because that it kind of just happened. Um, and then Wait. we did the investigation on it and everything, and yeah, we, I do have an we idea did the for, research. For a but up. to get more stories that would be, that would similar, similarly create a better narrative for the right, not just on campus, but a wider span of people, not just in our newspaper groups and the people that follow it consistently. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to go after things so much as being responsive and being quickly responsive is a good way to have this happen again. Okay. These types of false stories come out all the time and just being aware of them and responding with journalism and being open-minded, like being open-minded about where that journalism might take you. You might have had the biggest story also if you had found that it had been real. Um, but I do wish you guys would follow up on all the people who bought the fake story. I wish you would ask your governor to recant Evan McMullen yeah. and other back. people. He, dele he deleted the tweet. He didn't say anything about it. But Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. It might be good yeah. for follow-up. Okay. So, good work. I'm seriously so impressed. I'm going to be... Tommy, if you yes. could uh, just give a quick 30-second summary of this for anyone who's not... Oh, aware. sorry. Yeah. yeah, we should so, have done that. <laughs> basically, for those who don't, those who don't know... BYU and Duke had a volleyball game. A volleyball against Duke? Against, it was against Duke. BYU versus Duke volleyball game over at BYU. Rachel Richardson, one of the players on the Duke team, <clears throat> in the middle of the game accused or made a complaint that the N-word had been said from the student section. And then basically what happened after the game is that her godmother tweeted about this and then said she was repeatedly called the n-word over and over again every single time she served and she's running for a campaign in texas for like a judgment's a judge's seat and if you look at her twitter history it's like a bunch of anti-white racist tweets so there's a lot of conflict of interest then her dad went on espn and said that there were people who were joining in with this we didn't know that prior to um 
going through the story about his interview, because if there was, we originally put out a statement because BYU had banned someone, and we thought maybe that's a credible point. BYU banned a fan. Banned yes. a fan, and it was because that, that fan, he also happened to be autistic or had severe Asperger's. Mm -hmm. He went up to the students afterwards, like the Duke volleyball, and they said that they'd recognize his voice because they didn't actually point to anyone in the stands when the complaint was made. And so we put out a statement saying we don't think that this should be used to promote left-wing ideology on campus, but if this happens, that it's terrible. But then someone from the athletic department messaged us and said that this isn't actually what went down. And so that's kind of the backstory to the whole thing. And, and then and, your paper went yeah. and did an investigation and yeah. you like broken down Zapruder style, the section of the stands <laughs> that this was alleged to have happened. And yeah, because it went all the way up to like NPR within a weekend. Oh, yeah. Every major corporate media outlet repeated the, mm -hmm. this story without doing the due diligence that you guys did in reporting out the story. And eventually, your school did an investigation. Yeah, and, and they finished it like two weeks. They pretty much knew within a few days that it hadn't really happened the way that they described it in the stories. But they put out a statement a couple weeks afterwards saying that we interviewed over 50 people. I think, I personally believe BYU is terrible at PR. And I say that as a PR major. And most of the people in PR are liberal. But <clears throat> they put that statement out as an investigation. And then it kind of went through another media cycle when CNN and a few others, not everyone retracted, but there were a few major corporate, major media corporations that said, OK, BY did a full investigation. They tried to read lips, according to sources, on the tapes of people being videotaped at the game and took out the announcers' voices just to hear everything, and no one else witnessed it. It was basically a complete lie. Well, it is possible that the yeah, she could woman have believed she heard it, she could have but that does, that's not the same thing as saying everybody yeah. should have responded the way that they did. Exactly. But I thought the journalism you guys did was was great. And the, the other thing, that just for, for context, is that BYU apparently is the most uh, vigorous volleyball fandom in the USA. So it really was like an intense environment of people getting super into it. Yeah, it was also <laughs> on freshman orientation and all the freshmen had free passes to the game. Yeah, So it was and you guys were like people. hopped up on milkshakes or whatever you guys drink there, so. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. But anyway, there will be many, many more opportunities and what, what you did thus far was good for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you for speaking with us tonight. I'm Olivia Green from Patrick Henry College. Um, I was just, you've partially answered my question with the last few people, um, but I took your point uh, that it is not enough s simply for the conservative, um, you know, demographic to just stand athwart history yelling stop when no one's inclined to do so. Um, yet so much of what we talk about is resistance to propaganda, resistance to this progressive agenda. It seems like the liberal agenda is one of progressivism and almost that the conservative one is kind of a maintaining the status quo or holding on to as much of the status quo as possible. Um, but that's not flashy. And so how, what would you say is the balance between that resistance, that necessary resistance, and then pro-action? Right. That's what I think is the real big change that needs to happen here. We've had a conservative movement that for too long thought that just sort of suggesting that people slow down or stop would be sufficient to save the country. And now we really run the risk of this entire project falling apart. Um, and so much more action is needed. I don't want to be too prescriptive on what that means. But since we're at a conference on student journalism, I would just point out that really good journalism can educate and embolden people, remind them of the importance of ordered liberty and how that looks is gonna look totally different. I do, just if I, because I'm thinking of it because the BYU example, are there any people from Chicago reader, thinker? Oh, you guys, I love you people very much. Um, 
So the, so just again as a way of pointing out some of this, um, these guys go to a conference that their school holds on disinformation and the people who are on stage talking about disinformation are some of the country's preeminent pushers of disinformation. And they're in a room full of people, presumably much older than they are, who did not have the courage to point this out. And they, as I put it, like de-pantsed everybody on stage by just reminding them of some of the disinformation that they'd pushed, pointing out, um, you know, pointing out flaws in their reason and reasoning and thinking. And the whole country, you know, thanks you guys. It was really great work. I hope you get to talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but point just being, there are many ways to do, to do good here, but it does require a boldness and a courage and action to come up with some actual ideas. Like in my mind, and this is all like maybe much more complicated than what you're thinking about at the collegiate level, we have this fourth branch of government that's completely unaccountable to people, this administrative state that kind of has taken over and destroyed our understanding of, of um, you know, what it means to be governed by ourselves and have a government of, by, and for us. And so we need to think about ways to, we don't, we're, we're much less powerful than the entire regime that might have this like large bureaucracy, control of the media, control of academia. So we have to kind of think of ways that like our like our revolutionary forefathers that had much less advantage than these powerful armies to think about ways to kind of ping in and expose. So what these guys did was very effective and what these guys did was very effective. And so uh, you can take, you can take, even though you're, you're less uh, powerful or less, seemingly less powerful or less numerous than some of these uh, other entities, you can do a lot of really great work there. Thank you all for your questions, and uh, Molly, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. These uh, great examples that have just been pointed out to you, uh, they show that what you're doing on your campuses can make national news very quickly. And it's not just about making national news, of course. You do have to change things at the very local level if you want to see improvement on your campuses, improvement in our states, and in the country as a whole. But by improving things locally, by fighting these battles that have to be fought, by telling the truth, even when it's very difficult to do so on your campuses, you are able to, in many cases, bring attention to things that are um, shared experiences that other people have had as well, where they too have been silenced, they too have seen the facts altered by uh, established authorities in order to fit a progressive narrative that is in fact false. Uh, you on your campuses are able to bring the truth to people. That has just massive consequences. And as you can see, it even impresses people like Molly Hemingway who have you know, the ears of the nation. Uh, so I, I congratulate all of you on the very fine work that you are doing. I have a couple of housekeeping notes as we go uh, into tomorrow. First of all, uh, when we begin tomorrow's sessions, please do bring your name tags and uh, your folders with you so you know what's uh, in the schedule. Breakfast is right here in this room starting at 8 a.m. And uh, our first session of the day will in fact be a breakout session. So take a look at your schedules and decide uh, which of those first sessions at 9 a.m. Uh, you'd like to attend. Uh, last but very far from least, our hospitality uh, tonight uh, is about to begin at 9.30 p.m. right there in the hallway where we had our reception. And uh, I hope very much that you will um, uh, enjoy the uh, refreshments that we are able to make available to you. So uh, you're journalists and you deserve to uh, have a bit of a reward this evening. So take care. <laughs> <laughs>